Good morning, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing good. I am uh, very excited to have you on the show. You have uh, quite the track record and you have a lot of information. I think most entrepreneurs in the mid-market want to hear and uh, you, you've got it coming from all different angles. But before we really dive into it, what, um, why don't you give the listeners that are not familiar with you or your background or the, the mid-market company that you're working for and the, the stuff that you're doing, can you just kind of give them a little bit of a backdrop of how you got to where you are and what you guys are doing? Sure. Um, so, you know, as, as you know, I'm the executive director of the National Center for the Middle Market. That's a research team uh, at the Fisher College of Business at The Ohio State University. Uh, we are a collaboration between Ohio State and our sponsors, who are SunTrust Banks, Grant Thornton, and Cisco Systems. And we've been around for seven years, seven and a half years. We were formed um, actually with, with, with a founding grant from GE Capital back then. We were formed with the mission of sort of learning about and teaching to mid-sized companies. And, and, and the reason for that is that there's a whole lot of, va it's almost a white space on the map, what the, what the middle market is. Um, when we started out, there, first of all, there's no uniform definition. So, so we started out sort of saying, what, well, the middle market is going to be the middle third of the private sector. Let's find that. Mm. And when you do that, you set your sliders to a pretty wide revenue band of $10 million to a $1 billion in annual revenue. You know, that's two orders of magnitude, but, but they're bigger than small and they're smaller than big. They're mostly not startups. We discover their median age is 31. Mm. I have a wisecrack that says that these companies are, are too big to be exempt from regulations and too small to buy a congressman of their own. <laughs> they, uh, but, but they're also, they're, they're kind of the forgotten middle child. Uh, and, and the reason in part is that the big guys can create their own weather. The small guys, by terms of sheer numbers, I mean, you know, millions mm -hmm. and millions of moms and pops, and the role of chambers of commerce and the small business administration, which exists as an advocate for them, have a voice. But in the middle, the voice is muted, it's dispersed. Most of these companies are private. Uh, and that fits very much into, into your story, Ryan, which mm -hmm. is that 85% of them are private. Of, of that group, of the 85%, about a third are family businesses, uh, about a third are private equity owned, and as you know, in many cases, those are businesses that were family businesses that, mm -hmm. that sell to private equity. And, and then another third are partnerships or sole proprietorships or, or you know, closely held, you know, three or four guys get together and, and, and say, Hey, let's put on, let, let's create a company. So there, and, and there's some, there's some different sort of structures in there. So it's a really interesting group of companies of, of companies. Now for me, part of what's fascinating about it is that um, my own background, like a lot of people's is in business is, is really different. I went my, I started out in my, career in the book publishing business, went, but then I went and started working for Fortune magazine. And of course, our bread and butter was the Fortune 500 uh, and, and, you know, corporate giants. And, and mm -hmm. we would write, you know, from time to time about smaller companies, but hey, people wanted to see, you know, General Motors, IBM, Bill Gates, you know, that, those <laughs> right. are the guys they wanted to see on the cover. You don't sell more co copies of Fortune by putting the CEO of Tootsie Roll, you know, on, on the cover <laughs> of the magazine, right? And, and after Fortune, I went to Harvard Business Review, and I, I ran Harvard Business Review for half a dozen years. And again, one of the things that's really interesting about academic work, well, first of all, HBR's focus is, again, it's largely, the emphasis is largely on large and often multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. Not entirely, but that's the emphasis. And that's also partly true because academic researchers, well, you know, the old story about the drunk who looks for his keys under the lamppost because the light is better. Um, <laughs> you know, scholars need data. All right. <laughs> and there ain't no data about private companies. There's, a, there's very little. So again, I wasn't seeing much about them. After HBR, I went to work for Booz & Company, which was, which no longer exists. Booz & Company was spun off from Booz Allen Hamilton, or did we divorced. And Booz Allen Hamilton did all the government services stuff, and Booz & Company did the commercial strategy consulting. And Booz just sold, sold about four years ago to 
PwC and is now called Strategy and so it's the Strategy Consulting Advisory Group of PwC. And again, though, our focus tended to be with bigger companies, some of them public, some of them private, but big global companies, all the strategy firms really emphasize the, you know, the McKinsey's, the BCG's, the Bain's, they're, they're at, at, and, and strategy and, and their, their focus tends to be on larger companies. So, so I came to the middle market, like I've been doing a lot of research and thinking and writing about business, written at that point, two books, wrote a third book after that. But all of it had been about Basically, you know, the assumption was that there was a public shareholder and the assumption was you were kind of big. And I walked into this world and I thought, where have you been all my life? I mean, it's the most, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, this, this is the most fascinating group of companies I've, I've, I've ever, I've ever worked with. Mm. Uh, I mean, I could tell you, I will, we've got time. I can tell you stories about a little company here, a little company. I, uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, I'm up in uh, Buffalo, New York. And I'm meeting with a bunch of people. And among the people I'm talking to and meeting are, are companies like this, New Era. They make sporting, half the time if you're wearing a, you know, a, a Twins baseball cap or, or a, a Vikings cap or something like this, maybe made by New Era, right? So mm -hmm. middle market company makes these caps. Another middle market company, you're driving down the road and you see a truck with a roll down back door, you know, back door in the truck. Yeah, and yeah. it says whiting. You know, seen that thing that says whiting on the back of the truck? Yeah. Middle market company. Or you go into a bar and you put your foot on a bar on a bar uh, bar rail. That bar is probably made by a comp that bar rail is probably made by another middle market company called Kegworks. They're outside of Buffalo and they are they are they make other kinds of bar equipment, but they are, among other things, one of the biggest makers of bar rails in the United States. So you, you know, you're discovering companies like this all over the place, sports teams, craft, you know, any beer <laughs> that yeah. you've heard about. You know, so if you haven't heard about it, it's a microbrew, right? If you have heard about it and it's horse piss, <laughs> it's, it's a big company. <laughs> but, you know, Sam Adams, Abita Beer, Corona, Brewdog here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Great Lakes, uh, Revolution Brewer beers in, in Chicago. Uh, I don't, I, I don't have the Minneapolis one where you are. And, and, right? oh, but, we're we're, we're middle, coming on from the charts the, here. The best thing about the middle market is the food. You know, I mean, it's great. It's a great bunch of companies. So then, how you know what? Where did the what was the mission for you know for you? Because a couple of questions, Tom. Because you know the mission that you guys have, and like you said, where have you been all my life? <laughs> what was it that you were trying to solve? And then also, uh, you know, kind of my, my, it's funny because I agree with everything you're saying, like the, you and I could probably ramble back and forth about the most intrigue, like there's the ways to make money and how people do it is just mind boggling. And, but you know, the way that I describe it when I was telling you my story or these, all these people that I work with or these stories that we hear, it's like the world the, my analogy I've given Tom is it's like the world of real estate before the internet and before Zillow. You'd have to literally hire a real estate person to go take go flyers. And drive from house to house. Like, yeah. like, Hey, what did you sell your house for? And like, you know, like there's literally no information out there whatsoever. And it's just kind of like the wild, wild west yet. Like you'd said, there's a third of these people that run our economy and there's like, there's not a whole lot of stuff around there. It's just, it's so antiquated. So I'm just curious and like, what was the mission and then how have you guys been evolving? What have you been doing over the last seven years? Yeah. So, so the, 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 I sort of think of the mission as, as, as being, well, there's sort of three kinds of things that we do. We're, you know, part of the Ohio State University. So, so education is an important part of what we do. Research is an important part of what we do. And outreach is an important part of what we do. And if you think of those, you can almost make a make a matrix. The, the former consultant and me showing up and thinking, "Here's a slide." Uh, <laughs> but but you know, you think one of the things we do is we try, try to create knowledge about the middle market. So who are these guys? How important are they? How much do they matter to local state? national economies how critical are they in different industries because as i said they sort of fly below the radar uh, an example of that is we do a lot of work with the uh the brookings institution and they're doing a lot of work with cities on economic development mm -hmm. and if you talk to a lot of the economic development people at cities 
or look at how they spend their time, they think about, let's support small business. Let's have yet another, you know, biotech incubator, or let's, you know, try to offer a subsidy to a new sports team, or let's, or, or to keep a sports team, or let's offer a big tax break for a big company to come move here. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how they spend their activities, you know, stealing subsidies and startups. But if you want to look at job growth, the job growth comes from supporting the mid-sized companies that are already there. So, you know, knowledge of and knowledge about the middle market is critical for policymakers, journalists need to know about it, academics need to know about it, all kinds of people need to know that there's plenty of territory not illuminated by the lamppost. The second kind of knowledge is knowledge for, because that goes to that other thing that scholars and the consulting firms and the magazines that write about business with, 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 with sort of stuff that gives you managerial insight, mm-hmm. um, that focuses either on entrepreneurs, Inc. Magazine, God bless them, they're great, uh, or on big companies. A- mm-hmm. and there's, but there's very little. So, so take, for example, innovation and what we know about innovation. A lot of the sort of research about innovation has to do with like portfolio theory and how do you develop a, you know, a pattern or a plan for, for, for innovation that has some re- relatively safe, close in bets and some also some stuff that is farther out there. It's great, right? But we discovered that a typical middle market company has three projects in a year. So, yeah, it's not necessarily portfolio theory. It's like, okay, what, yeah, randomly, what yeah. randomly jumped on our table or was there an executive with a really good idea or they were in like a peer group that someone brought up with something? <laughs> yeah, now it does turn out, we've done studies that show that having a predictable budget for innovation makes a huge difference. So it's not just like, you know, an on off switch and it's random. No, this year we're going to do something, but you know, you just, so, so, but the, basically you can take a look at the literature on innovation. And if you're running a mid-sized company, you can throw out three quarters. of it. And the same thing is true with like supply chain. Again, almost all of the stuff on supply chain is about, Hey, this is how Procter and Gamble manages its supply chain. And that's interesting and important, but most mid-sized companies are links. Mm-hmm. So we did a study on how do links, what makes a perfect link? How do you succeed as part of somebody else's supply chain? Nobody looked at that. So, so we do knowledge about and knowledge for, and sort of the mission is to help these companies grow and succeed more and to help that success be recognized so that, you know, in the larger business ecosystem, whether it's policy or anything else, the middle market companies are at the table so that they and, and, and so that they're recognized and and, and get get a say in in that environment. Well, I that I absolutely love the mission that you guys are on because I think it is such a black hole and, and the the. You know, I've never had actually had it perfectly articulated like you have, or like you know, because all these I've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, well, well rehearsed. But I think honestly, Tom, it's like you know, when I look at so I just kind of you know giving you a little bit more context. If I think about where I came from, or my clients, or the people that are listening to this, they're probably in you know EO, so Entrepreneurs Organization, or Vistage, or Tab, or all these people. Yeah. Who are like yeah. And they have yeah, big problems. With Vistage and tech, uh, old, former tech, and yeah, mm-hmm. and, and there's, there's some, yep. Yeah, so, but, you know, and it's still complicated to being able to get to the information to be able to judge what you're doing compared to. It's still a lot of he said, she said, but there's no like, hey, you know, I'm going to pull up, like you said, all these you know publications or research where it's like not really applicable to you. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. you throw yeah. all the different dynamics in it. But um, I'll give you, can I give you an example of that? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, for um, sure. We did a study a couple of years ago. Actually, this was inspired by some work that we did when I was at Booz like seven or eight years ago when we took public company data and looked at how well people are managing their working capital, right? You know, mm-hmm. how, how, how fast are you paying your bills? How fast are you getting paid? How much inventory? You, how much money are you tying up in, in running the business? And we discovered that for big public companies, there were enormous differences in their efficiency with working capital management. So I said, hey, let's do this for middle market companies. And so we did two things. One, we did a survey, which we asked 
middle market companies, you know, about their working capital practices. And we also asked them, how satisfied are you? How well do you think you manage working capital? And 75% said that they, are on a five point scale, put themselves in the top two box. We, you know, extremely well or very well. We are satisfied with how well we manage working capital. And then we compared this because we took a public company database because you can get these data for mid-sized companies and said, here's the benchmark data. And what we discovered is that of those people, those 75% who say they're highly or very satisfied, at least half of them are way wrong. <laughs> because, because the gap, I mean, whether it's payables, receivables, or inventory, mm -hmm. the gap between the 25th percentile and the 50th percentile is 2x. Whoa. And between the 50th and the 75th is 2x. So the gap between 25 and 75 is 4x. Mm -hmm. On average, mid-sized companies pay their bills 16 days before they get paid, just to take an example. And so I, I just, I thought that these, you know, I thought, first of all, they need the, they didn't know. Mm -hmm. So the presence of benchmarking data, to your point, is a way of saying, oh, wait a minute, I could do better. And, and without these, the, without the sort of, gee, what's best practice, it's kind of hard to know how well you're doing. And the other thing I thought, this sort of gets to some of the family business questions, is in many cases, these guys are not satisfied, they're satisficed. And they say, you know what? I like to go home on Friday knowing that all my bills are paid. <laughs> I like to play golf knowing I don't know, I don't own a penny to anybody. And 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 so they're they're comfortable. That feels like a safe place. And yet it's like they're driving a car getting 25 miles to the gallon when they could be getting 40 miles to the gallon. It's 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 you know. It, it it's it, and knowledge can give you the real power to change and mid-sized companies need it that's w well said and i i think about you know and th this i want to tie into because we've got a couple of those these these big reports and stuff like that that i want to dive yeah. into of the, in, the insights you have but before we do that you know tom like the when you said that knowledge is the power to be able to know how you're well you're doing and it's so difficult because otherwise you're just stuck in like essentially a solitary confinement by like, okay, like I feel good right now, not having any clue what the rules of the game are. And like, how else can you, you know, I just, I even think about like with that working capital, how do you go to your, you know, your vendors or your clients and explain to them why you want to modify what you've been doing if you have no reason? You know, you can't articulate a reason if you've got no benchmarks, so therefore you just leave it as is because yeah, you, know, exactly. you just get, you have this fear of the unknown like I just think about some of our big clients where like you, you just they kind of just bully you around and you deal with it when you if you were to explain to them hey like here's all the information that I need and here's how I describe it but you know it, it, like just as a nugget for later we can circle back to this but I think the you know your example on working capitals great but the big huge problem that I see is most of these people have zero idea how much their company is worth and why absolutely there's no, and there's, that's where it really gets into the, this is the world before Zillow. And it's, there's just, you know, and it, there's a lot of, you know, pros and cons about that. Mainly cons is that a lot of these people get taken, you know, a lot of the owners like ourselves or the listeners, they get taken advantage of because it's a game that they have not been educated with rules by. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. So let's, with that, sorry, I, <laughs> I just get pretty passionate about it. That, but with that, I think, you know, what you guys are doing, and as I was saying on the, the website that the listeners will have to go to and the reports, but where have you been focusing on your time for the the, the research that you're doing and how have you brought it together? Because you've got the, the seven different characteristics, you've got some DNA, you've, you're starting to get after seven years, some real power behind what you guys have aggregated. So maybe kind of give us a little bit of an overview of that. Yeah, let, let's let's do two things. First of all, you mentioned the website, and the website is middlemarketcenter.org, uh, and we can mention that a few other times as people go through. But but all of this stuff is there. I mean, one of the nice things about our being a uh, an academic organization is we do gate it. We you know we 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 sometimes we ask for your email address, but but uh, and give you an opportunity to sign up for stuff. But but it's but it's just a little tiny gate. Uh, it's a baby gate. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's all out there. And in many cases, we even post some of the raw data. So so uh, one of the things that we do every quarter is, this gets to 
the the growth model. We have we have actually been able after a lot of years of of doing this to be able to create a model of growth for middle market companies that we call the DNA of middle market growth. And and what happens is that every quarter we survey a thousand middle market companies for what we produce is our middle market indicator. And we ask them a couple hundred questions. I mean, I mean, re range, well, a couple hundred different data points from each one. And we've got, you know, industry and revenue within three bands, three, three groups. We've got location and we've got um, number of employees and we got, we've got a whole bunch of firmographic data. And then we ask them, how's business? We ask them and about their, revenue growth. Uh, they won't usually, because they're private companies, they won't tell us revenue numbers, but they'll say, I grew 10%, I grew 6.3%, whatever it is. We ask about employment growth. We ask about whether they've entered a new market in the last year, whether they've done a deal, M&A, acquired or sold anything. We ask them about IT investment and so on and so forth. And we ask them about plans. We ask them about future investment. Throw all that together. We've now, we took five years of those data 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. And that means 20,000 companies, a couple hundred data points on each one, and I can't do that math. So, but it's basically, it's a huge, you know, soup of data. And we then did a big Bayesian analysis of that. And, you know, a Bayesian statistical analysis is one where you, you look for connections and correlations between things. And, 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 and you can weight them, uh, and you can, in some cases, you can actually infer not just correlation, but causation. And, and so that was the first thing. And then the second thing is we took that and did a cluster analysis. So we, out of all this, we ended up with a group of growth factors. Growth was what we were trying to, what explains growth? And we were able to find a bunch of drivers that, that, that explain growth. And then we were also able to create three kind of types, um, almost mindsets about growth. When we looked at the drivers, we then threw out two of them that were not under management's control. And one of them was the overall condition of the, of the economy. And, and we, we have a data point about confidence, about confidence in state, local, and, or, uh, 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 and national, or, or sorry, local, national, and global economy. So we used that as a proxy for the state of the economy. And the other was industry effects. So we took out, I can't control the economy. I can't control my industry. I, I live or breathe with, you know, if I'm in healthcare, I'm happier than if I'm in uh, uh, retail, for example. Um, <laughs> but although retail's not doing too badly, actually. But 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 then we so you throw out the industry effects and you're left with seven things, seven mm -hmm. sort of factors that that come together in different ways to drive growth, and and the the, the first of them is sort of it sort of seems kind of obvious, but it's market expansion. You know, am I expanding from you know Minneapolis to Missoula and from Missoula to um, you know, Montego, I mean, am, am I opening up new markets? And, and within that, you know, how, how hard is my, how, how effective is my sales force? Do I have a communications and marketing capability? Am I not only attracting new markets, but attracting new customers within those markets that I've got? Uh, am I going global? Uh, am I, pushing back against global guys who are moving into my space. So, so there's a bunch of activities. And that turns out, those, those market expansion activities turn out to account for a little under a quarter, 23.4% of the growth of middle market companies. So it's a big deal. Second thing, the second factor was whether we have a formal growth strategy. And, and let me, what this means is, do we sit down as a management team and say, do we have a strategy or are we just sort of reacting to, you know, what, what's coming mm -hmm. in there? Do we have a, a growth strategy in place and do we have a way of translating our, our goals in our, and our strategic intent into 
budgets and goals and plans, and do we communicate that? And by the way, it turns out a very interesting sub-factor in there is, am I paying attention and keeping up to date with management thinking? Mm -hmm. So, you know, actually, it was interesting. I was talking to a company um, outside of Cleveland that said uh, that, that when they first started, their strategy was sort of student body left or student body right. Said, you know, we'd get a new client and we'd swarm to that new client. And, and, and then we get another new client, we'd swarm to that new client. <laughs> we never said no, and we didn't know, and we didn't have a sort of a formal thing like, hey, what are the kinds of clients we want? And mm -hmm. what are the kinds of clients we don't want? And it turned out they were, you know, as you can imagine, they were wasting a lot of time. They were, they were, you know, wasting resources, chasing will of the wisps, but also and, and also doing things that they shouldn't have done. So that how do we you know, get organized around this. That matters a lot. And what's interesting is it matters both at all size levels. I mean, it matters as much at 100 million as it does at 15 million or 500 million. So that was the second factor. And then right up, and that was like 14 and a half percent of the model. Right under it, two, you know, a tenth of a percentage point underneath it was investing and innovating. And that gets to what I was talking about earlier. It's like, have I got a, this, and it connects to plans, like all these things link, right? Am I investing in new product and new product development? And by the way, have I got a budget so I'm doing it every year and not just when I have a eureka moment in the bathtub? Am I investing in systems and business processes? Am I keeping my factories up to date? Am I constantly thinking about, you know, better ways in which uh, I, I can, I can, you know, run the shop and, and build my plant and equipment as I need it. Do I think that I'm able to withstand a downturn? Have I, have I invested? I've got enough cushion even to invest. So that's the third factor. Well, and then can I even just yeah. interject for a couple of seconds to your time? Because what I find is very intriguing about the sheer quantity of data that you have. And then by the way, for the listeners who like, we'll have it in the show notes, but the, the, the cluster analysis and like, like, for for most of us, we're all ADD entrepreneurs that are visu visually like appealing to look at stuff. So this is not like some ridiculous white paper. You guys have done a really great job breaking it apart so like you could literally look at charts and graphs and go, I get it. And when I you know, going back to like your clusters of what you did for the for the the seven growth factors, I don't know if you ever saw it. LinkedIn did this for a little while, time where they had you could like download that uh, that analysis and then you'd be able to see who are your big like essentially anchor connections to everybody else. And well, that's essentially what you've done is you've you've boiled it down to the bare truth and essence of what these are. Because I, as you were talking about the innovative investing, you know what the 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 complications that I see that's out there in the other kind of sporadic data is it's kind of made up. BS from investment bankers or private equity firms or different research tools that only you know research a couple of things. So there's a lot of fragmented information that, that for me when I look at this, if I always go, well, why? You know, so like for example, like when you listed these three, you have all these sub things that interact to like, like essentially the main top umbrella, right? So I think it's just I find it interesting of how you're analyzing this compared to like, you know, I don't know if you've got and comment on like, you know, all the other information that's out there, like, because, you know, you'd say, okay, this investment bankers, like, they're going to go and look at IT system, they, they, they list all this stuff, but essentially, they're all rooted in one common factor. Well, and, the, and don't forget, they are trying to sell something, which is, you know, you can't blame them. <laughs> yep. so, so they are actually, you know, going to have, I, I remember once when I was talking to uh, Bruce Wasserstein, when I was at HBR, I did an interview with him, and he was, you know, the uh, CEO of Lazard Frere. And mm -hmm. before that, he was at, uh, Boston, what was the name of it? I can't remember that. He was famous when he was a young man as being Break Him Up Bruce. He was a private equity <laughs> investor and, yeah. at, at one of those, you know, release shareholder value guys. But he said that he liked as an investment banker to sit down with incoming CEOs and say, what do you want your legacy to be in five, 10 years? And because it, it was a question they usually hadn't been asked. And then he'd listen to him talk. And after a while, he, he'd say, you know, I heard you say one, two, three, four, five. And, you know, an investment banker can help you with two and four. And so maybe we can talk about it. So, you know, we're sort of in that first phase. We're not trying to say, and here's something we've got to sell you. We're trying to say, here's the picture. Mm -hmm. and, and what's really interesting is 
you know, the, the seven growth factors here are, are, you know, market expansion, former growth strategy, investing in innovators. Then there are two about talent and one about financial management and one about cost efficiencies. So my COO and my CFO play key roles. The talent ones are interesting because there are two. There's not just one. I was going to say, you can keep going because I didn't mean to interrupt you in the middle. Yeah, no, like, no, it's all right. It? It's all right. The two talent factors, one of them is, am I attracting and retaining top quality people, including especially at the top of the house? So one is the quality of my human capital. And the other one is, am I developing my people? And they are different. Obviously, they're related, right? But one piece is, have I got great raw material? The second piece is, and am I doing great stuff with the raw material? Mm -hmm. Am I keeping it? I'm having great, you know, getting and keeping great raw material. And the other is, am I developing and working with the raw material I have? One thing that's really interesting about mid-sized companies is they tend to invest relatively little in staff development. Uh, one of the things we learned in some other research that we did is, you know, if they've got a, if they've got an opening, if they've got a round hole, they look for a round peg mm -hmm. rather than say, gee, there's a square peg that I can, you know, that I can, you know, whittle down. They look for something that fits harder to do now that we got full employment and there are fewer, you know, round pegs out there. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, so we are seeing more, investment in training and development internally. But when you think about it, we were talking to some guys at uh, ADP and they were telling me that the rule of thumb from the Society for Human Resources Management is that you got one full-time HR person for every 75 full-time employees. Yeah, that's, that's, well, that's, that's true, yeah. yeah. So if you've got a company with 300 employees, you're gonna have four people in HR. Yeah, how are you going to do training? Oh, right. We got that's three generalists and an admin, right? You know, so. And by so, the way, like, yeah, because I actually, <laughs> then there's this whole argument. There, right? that it rolled, yeah. And yeah. like, I would argue, like, are these people actually, are, are they mainly just admin? Because they're probably, you know, paying 70 grand for them. And they're not leaders who are saying, what should we learn? Where, what kind of resources? How do we educate them? <laughs> they're are, doing basic, you know, they're doing <laughs> pay and benefits, job descriptions. Right, right. Maybe a little succession planning but even mm -hmm. that is light uh and, you know and and they're so, so and that's important basic stuff but they're not in a doing some so and, and they're doing some some helping with recruiting right how do we how, how do we find better people but training and development comes after that so the interesting thing is if you double click on that training and development thing which is 10 percent of total growth i mean train staff develop getting your people getting good people is like 14 percent getting those people better is 10%. That's a non-negligible number, right? But it turns out that inside that, more important than the formal training and investment and education stuff that you do is, is providing career pathing. So that if you're working for me, I can see a path or you can see a path to your next job, to your promotion, to how to become better. You got a mentor and a path and if you've got that, then in a sense, you can start taking charge of your own development. I don't have to send you to a course or give you a, mm -hmm. you know, a website or a, or a little manual. You will start, you'll say, ah, if I learn this, you can take, you can take some responsibility for this. And that's, that turns out to be, I mean, that's something you can do with culture, right? Right. And, and it turns out to be a, a, something that is of non-negligible value in driving growth. So one of the things I love about this study, the DNA of middle market growth, is you, you look inside and you think, oh, wow, look at this. Like retaining profitable accounts is a really important thing. And so is overall sales force effectiveness. So what can I do with my overall sales force, what can I do to help my sales force learn more about retaining profitable accounts? And if I put those two together, you know, you can begin to say, gee, this is what we're going to do with our reps this quarter, or this, this six mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. and, and it really turns into work that, you know, into something that is, that's practical. And, 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 and I, I, I love the way that, that, that you can take these data 
And if you do it, you can just look at them in the data sheet. That's interesting. But if you take them with this sort of like, hmm, what's in here that I can grab and turn into what we're going to do next year? Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's actually a lot of richness in it. I, so, uh, yeah, I, it's one of those things, Tom, where I've always operated like this. And so it's confusing to me when people don't get the big picture because that's, uh, you know, like what you, just what you describe with the career pathing. But it's essentially kind of what you're doing for the entrepreneur and what both of us are trying to do where once you see, like I always say, like if you show someone the picture of a puzzle and you dump it all out on the table, I mean, you don't have to show them piece by piece. You know, people can figure it out on their own. And it's kind of like with this these, you know, these big data points, it's like, hey, here's the big picture. Now you intuitively can kind of refine and like you said, keep clicking into the subcategories and making less stressful, like, you know, random in the dark shots. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. Uh, uh, one of the things that's interesting, I, told, I mentioned the cluster analysis and you mentioned mm -hmm. it too. You know, you then take all this stuff, right? This is the seven drivers that sort of fit for everybody. But, but then the question is, I'm a management team, right? Uh, we're a management team and we think we've got a hundred bucks to invest next year or it's budget season. Hey, we're starting, you know, what's our plan for next year? And we think, where are we going to put our resources? And we know they're limited. And, and one of the things that we learned is that we, we created, we found, we, we, we named, we labeled, but we found these sort of three clusters of group of companies that whose growth was above average. And one of them we called the investors and one we call the innovators, and one we call the efficiency experts. Now, these are not mutually exclusive. They, they're, they're, they're sort of, they're not sharp lines between them. They're fuzzy, but they're sort of like on the margin. Are you more one or more the uh, more or more one than the other two, or the major in one and minor in the other? Mm -hmm. The investors tend to be a little bit larger. They're a little bit more likely to be private equity owned. They're a little bit uh, they. Um, uh, and, and their basic thing is, you know, let's build, let's expand, let's put more into R and D, let's put more into new factories and equipment. Look, we're gonna, we've got money to invest, and we're gonna, we're gonna invest it in that kind of a thing. The innovators are a little bit younger, a little bit smaller. This is a too big a generalization, but I get a sense, I get a sense that they have less capital. They're a little more capital constrained, but you know what? I may not have a lot of money, but I got a lot of ideas. And so I, <laughs> yeah, can, I, can, relate. <laughs> I can substitute intellectual capital for financial capital. And mm -hmm. I'm going to say, and this is why I think they're also tend to be younger and smaller companies, right? So let's come out, let's, let's build better mousetraps. Let, let's invent better, better processes. Let's do process innovation, product innovation, service innovation, and let's do that. The efficiency experts tend to be a little bit older. They are a little bit more like, Hey, growth is great, but profitable growth is really more is really important. Uh, they uh, and that's their focus. They're, they're they're sort of saying like, how can we fund our own growth? How can we not get out over our skis so that we make sure that we're gonna we're gonna be the tortoise? We're gonna beat those hares, and we're gonna we're gonna grow that way. Now, what's interesting is we I, I mentioned these data came from 2012 to 2016, so that mm -hmm. five year period. This is like you might call it the Bermuda period of terms of business climate. You know, it's not too hot. It's not too cold. Interest rates are low. Uh, energy prices are low. There's no wage pressure. I mean, it, this was like, you know, really balmy economic times. So in, though, in that climate, the investors outperformed the innovators and the innovators outperformed the efficiency experts. Mm -hmm. I wonder what happens if you jack interest rates up three or four points. Right. I yep. wonder what happens if you get more volatility. Uh, if, I wonder what happens if you throw a bunch of tariffs into the market. You know, you, you, so, so if you get a weather that's a little bit less like Bermuda and a little bit more like, well, it doesn't have to be like Minneapolis, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but a little bit you more variable, uh, a little bit more variable. Uh, you know, do different strengths and capabilities come to the fore? But the thing that I like about it is you can think about this as as a, as a group, you know, as a family owns a business or as a, as a as a bunch of partners or as a, you know, where are we comfortable? What do we, you know, what, 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 ter what 
what's our, not just where are we comfortable, where are we excited? What turns us on and what also makes, what's our instinct? And if you think about that and you think, hmm, now I've got these seven drivers to invest in. I've got these, this hundred dollars to invest, but where am I going to put where? Right. And how am I going to think about my 2019 plan that supports this sort of identity that I have, uh, that, that we have, and that's us, that feels like us. So our decision will be different from the decision of those other guys down the street because our decision reflects who we are and who, and, and who we want to become. Well, and what's really cool about that, Tom, is I'm, I think articulating that, you know, the identity, but then also where you should be focusing your time. So again, it's all context. I just believe so much in context, then you can make your own decisions and kind of naturally go to the path that fits. But what I, what I find very interesting is I, as I think about the challenges that a lot of owners have after they sell, and you know, whether it's a private equity recapitalization or selling to a third party or to their manager, whatever exit option it is, they probably haven't articulated who's sitting across from me. So if you think about an innovator that sells to an efficiency person, think about just, just what you just said, how frustrating that would be, regardless of how much money you made. <laughs> or if an, yeah, you know, yeah. And, so it may be, and it may be what's happening. You know, it may be that's, that's the future of this company and that's what, or, or, but it could be the other way around. Yeah. Well, and I think yeah. it's just, you know, being conscious of it, then you can ask, right? So like, what are we going to be doing with our money and how are we going to be spending our time? Because, you know, if you have someone that's, you know, an investor that wants to grow, 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 but then, you know, they sell, if there's, I just find that just interesting because it's about the money, yeah. the motivation, yeah. and then the yeah. personality yeah. types, like you said. You know, we did, a, we did a, 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 as you know, we did a study on middle market M&A, uh, released it first part of uh, this year. Uh, and, and we found a whole lot of interesting things about this. And, and one of them, first of all, one of the things we found is that there's this sort of steady drumbeat. People keep thinking there's, you know, big increase in M&A. There, there, there isn't. It's about, you know, in any given uh, in, in any given year, about a quarter of middle market companies will have either bought something or sold something, uh, mostly buyers. It's about 20% will have bought something and about 5% will have sold or sold something. Um, you compound that over four or five years, and that means like a lot of them, you know, have had some kind of a transaction. But one of the numbers that really shocked me in here was the, the well, well first, first number is, is, you know, how inexperienced middle market companies are both as buyers or as sellers. Like for 29% we, of companies that had made a deal in the previous three years, it was their first ever acquisition. And for 41%, we've made other buys, but it's not, in, it's not part of our strategy. So 70% of the buyers were inexperienced. Sellers, 46% had never sold anything, nearly half. And 44% had sold parts of the business before, but it wasn't integral. So 90% of the buyers, of the sellers, were, were inexperienced. And then you looked at, were you intending to buy or intending to sell? And the first number that surprised me is 20%, 21% of the buyers were not expecting to buy something, but a deal showed up. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the lawyer called and said, hey, Ryan, <laughs> do you know that Joe's for sale? What? Or something happened, right? And, and so they were not only inexperienced, but unprepared. Like, oh, shit, that's an interesting idea. Let's, you know. Sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, 45% you know, say we're always looking for opportunities and, 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 uh, and, 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 and this one came along and 33% said we made a strategic decision and looked for a target. So one out of three said, Hmm, let's go by, we're in the gadget business, but we need widget capability. Mm -hmm. Let's find the best widget maker. Only a third had that 45% are saying, well, we're always shopping. Oh, that looks nice. And 20, 21% is like, we're completely unprepared. But then on the seller side, that 45%, we're not planning to sell. That 
does not shock me, but that is so crazy to actually have the numbers behind it. You know, well, it doesn't shock you, but didn't you think, so So, what? what is that? It could be that somebody died, right? So it could have been a tragedy. It could have been somebody died, somebody gets leukemia, somebody, whatever it is, oh my God, you know, mom's dead, we got to sell the company, whatever it might be. Uh, or it could have been the phone rang and somebody said, hey, Brian, have I got a deal for you? Would you have you ever considered selling? No, I'm not going to. We could pay a lot of money. No, I'm not. We could pay. Oh, that's interesting. You know, so 45% of the buyers were not in the market. So when you think about it, you know, they're naive. Oh, my they're gosh. They're, I know. And they're unprepared. And then, then you know, got another one. We, we sort of asked about um, the toughest challenges for the buyers. Ability to integrate was the toughest challenge and assessing the true value. You mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. What is this really worth? Because, you know, there may be often cases with like family businesses, for instance, the accounting isn't gap accounting. It's it's tax accounting. You know, mm -hmm. so I've got accounting. I know my books are for the tax man, but I really don't have books that would allow somebody else to put a value in the business. Mm -hmm. But integration comes to that culture issue. That was like assessing the culture of the target innovator. Efficiency expert, you know, investor, that's that's a big problem along with integration of the acquisition, which is another thing. You know, finding the right tar target or buyer was was really confusing. So on, on all ends of this, you get this this issue about fit. It really matters. Fit and fitness, right? One, do I have the right match? And, 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 you know, and by the way, does just be, do I have to sell just because somebody who rang the doorbell offered me a ton of money? I mean, that may not be the right buyer. Uh, it may not be right for my employees for, you know, it may not be right for the, you know, for my legacy. Uh, you know, there, there may be a lot of considerations that I have. So fit is a big deal. And the other thing is, as I said, fitness, <laughs> go back to that working capital figure. Mm -hmm. If you sell to a private equity firm, working that, you know, all that value, that free money that would be freed up. Why don't you get that instead of waiting for the buyer to get it? Right. Uh, you know, right. it drive your, it'll drive your purchase price higher. But, but the other thing is like, if you want to think about what it would take to be deal ready, remember 45% of the time, you don't know, you know, you walk around the corner and somebody says, Hey, you want to make a deal? What would it take? You'd want to be, you'd want to have clear governance. You want to know, Who's who makes a decision? What is the operating authority? Does your, you know, does your aunt Mary, who owns ten percent, have a veto power? You know, these are things that <laughs> families often don't deal with, right? Yeah. Talent. I've I, I've got you know a company of one hundred and fifty people, and twenty of them are critical. Have I got succession plans? Have I got a plan so that if we so that they'll stay? Mm -hmm. If we lose control, you know, what's my talent plan? Uh, and, and if I haven't got a retention plan, if I got a succession plan, right? Accounting, are my books in shape? I mentioned that. Planning, have I got plans, budgets, and KPIs so that I can, so that, you know, I, by the way, that'll save a whole ton of time and due diligence on one side. And, and the other, you get right? more value out of that too. Exactly. Likewise, operations, right? Have I documented my processes or is the only person who knows how to fix the fax machine, the 64 <laughs> year old admin who's not going to stay, you know, uh, working capital mentioned that technology. Have I got, you know, I mean, cybersecurity and technology due diligence is part of m and now. It wasn't five mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. but you know, whether you're buying or selling, it's like, if you were buying a house, would you have, would you buy a house without an engineer looking at it? You know, mm -hmm. cyber technology did a advisors, like I've got an accountant, I've got a lawyer. He's the family lawyer, but does that lawyer know anything about M and A? Does that oh, lawyer know? You're, any hitting, you're hitting a chord here with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. and often, you know, so, so, so you want to build those relationships in advance so that you don't have to build them like, oh my God, I need a lawyer, right? Am I, you know, you don't want to build, you don't want to hire a lawyer when, you know, when the cops are at the door and, and also peers, like one of the things both buyers and sellers these days face is there is a, I think the scientific term is a shit ton of private equity money out there, trillions of yep. private equity money out there waiting to be invested. So if I am a company and I want to make an acquisition, I'm as a strategic buyer, I'm competing with financial buyers. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the things that I can do is I can get to know my industry peers better. So I can say, hey, Ryan, maybe we should get together or I can make deals. There's an interesting company called Dasky. They do flatbed trucks uh, and they've grown to about to a billion dollar company by acquisition and they've never made a hostile acquisition. They've mostly bought moms and pops, small companies, uh, you know, 50 million, $20 million companies across the country by getting to know the industry and saying, I like this guy. He's a great operator. He fit with us. And so they, they have been able to grow a tremendous and very profitable business in part by expanding a peer network so mm. that they and thinking hard about culture too, so that they they have been able. They're a, they're an investor in our profile. Uh, it's a model on the DNA of middle market growth, but they've used that to with brilliant effect in M and A as a deal maker, uh, and 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 use that peer network. So those nine points, you know, and this is all in the middle market mm -hmm. acquisition, middle market M&A study of governance, talent, accounting, planning, operations, working capital, technology, advisors, and peers. Boy, every one of those can make you a better buyer or a better seller. And if you're selling and moving to Scottsdale, you know, you're going to be able to buy a bigger house. Well, and I think, you know, there's so many takeaways that I absolutely like. It, it's, you know, what I find crazy going, I'm going back to it, Tom, is that there's no place to go find this information. And then no place to like say, it. It, it, there's still, I, I'm an analogy guy. So it's like, okay, that'd be like you and I, you know, I always go back to checkers versus chess. So like there are different rules or different games, but the boards kind of look the same. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, you don't know what game you're playing if you don't know all this information. So, you know, you got the nine points of the value building and, the, and like understanding M&A, but then you get the three different uh, uh, profiles and then the seven grow, uh, growth factors and by the way no i was going to say they're all prime numbers but they're not nine is not a prime number <laughs> i should have fixed that we should have had 11. <laughs> there you go <laughs> and it so going back to one of your points earlier is the chances that someone that knows nothing about buying companies finds a company that buys that no that that person's never sold something and you literally have two people bumbling around with potentially people that are H and R block. I had that first date when I was a freshman in high school. <laughs> like, uh, we're both lucky. I don't know, are, we, are we like continuously uh, lucky or is this going to work out? But <laughs> Well, let's not underestimate how smart these guys are because they are, and they're often, I mean, the middle, one of the things we know is that middle market businesses outperform big business and small business in terms of growth. So it's Very, not, no, no, they're, not they're a, bu a bunch of really sharp people, but they need the stuff I mean, I think about it, what our, our mission is helping create practical management insights in the, written in the native language of a mid-sized company. So you don't have to translate it right. from what works for IBM or what works for uh, a startup. You say, this is actually about me and I can apply this pretty directly. And when, when, we're, we're, when we're hitting, uh, and we sometimes miss, but when we're hitting that, that's what I think the, the National Center for the Middle Market can do. Well, and can I give you a sweet analogy? Because I, like, I think you're right that there is so much talent and so much smarts here. So here's, here's an analogy that I've gravitated towards where you got a golfer, two golfers potentially. So you got a golfer that is a scratch golfer and they're – a, I mean, they're obviously to be a scratch golfer. You're extremely talented, right? <laughs> like you're you're killing it, and everybody's trying to get you know to where you are. And I think a lot of the mid market entrepreneurs are scratch golfers. But the difference between that and taking information like you're doing and then really getting to the next level is if you're a scratch golfer and you you met, let's say you you pull something and then there's wind and there's rain. Can do you know why you're a scratch golfer? Like, can yeah. you adjust? Do you know I could do this versus that? And I and then still be a scratch golfer in all the different conditions. The people that are the professionals or they're leveling up their game, they take you the information, the data that you're doing to always be a scratch golfer, no matter what happens, because they have like at least insight of if this changes, then that happens. So it's just, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things that we learned in the growth study and it shows up again in our 
in, in a study that we're we're doing on uh, on strategic planning on that on on that uh, planning process stuff is that keeping up with the literature matters you know you, if you're working in the business that's great but you need to be working on the business and all of the data about markets and customers and all of the other stuff that you got there it really helps to have a I guess a framework or a context that which you help think, yeah, this is what it means. And, mm -hmm. and, and that sort of knowledge can help you put these pieces together so that I say, this is what I see, but this is what it means. And therefore this is what I can do about it. And, and, and that's, that's exactly, your scratch call for thing is exactly right. I mean, you know, can I do it every day? Anybody, you know, I could bowl a 300 game you know, maybe once, right? But can I bowl above 250 regularly? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, likewise with golf. I mean, you know, I've, well, I've, me and golf, I've played one one round of golf in my life and, and, and uh, <laughs> I, I've just, you know, but so, so uh, you know, that, that would be, I wouldn't, I would be a scratch in the sense like a, a horse that gets scratched. You know, <laughs> right. Please keep me out. But, you know, it's, it's that, it's some, that ability to, you know, businesses, business, Business, to change sports metaphors, business doesn't end after nine innings. It doesn't end after extra innings. Business doesn't end. Mm -hmm. So there's always another inning. There's always another quarter. And, and you know, eventually maybe, yeah, eventually you sell. Uh, eventually something happens to a business. Uh, you hope you have to, you hope you can sell when you're at the top of your game. But basically there's always another quarter. There's always another year. And so to be able to say I won the game today is great. Uh, uh, you know, or, or I, or I had a great at bat. is great. But what you really need is you need to, that, that you need the, the capabilities and the consistency to, to do it over and over and over again and to still find it refreshing and fun. Well said. And I don't even know, usually I normally wrap up time with if there isn't anything, you know, we've touched on a lot. And um, if there's something that you want to highlight or there's a big takeaway you want to leave the listeners, what, what would it be? I think the takeaway would, would, would be uh, www.middlemarketcenter.org. First I of all, the it. website That's, would be a good thing. But, yep. you know, the, the other thing is I, I, I think that, that what I, we were saying earlier about, you know, we can understand uh, the drivers of growth. We can understand market conditions. We can understand the things that we need to do. But you also have to understand yourself personally and yourself organizationally so knowing you know knowing who you are and and what, when people talk about what success looks like it's not just a bunch of numbers success looks like this kind of being this kind of human being or this kind of corporate entity and so i think that sense of what success looks like in that larger sense is something that can help companies and help executives make better decisions about how they're going to put their, their, their money, their talent, their people to work. So we have the website and then is there any, you know, personal contact for you or just drive everybody to the website? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, you know, I, I'm also on LinkedIn. It's Thomas A. Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T on LinkedIn. And, and that's probably the easiest way to find me. Tom, thank you so much for coming on. I had an absolute blast. Likewise. Thank you. This was, this was terrific, and, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity.